kind asked me to give this talk as a public service announcement, so uh, that's why I'm here. And it works. So unless you've been in a coma for the last five years, you're aware that there's an opioid crisis here in America and worldwide. And in your own communities, it varies on how severe it is and what's happening, and particularly as perfusionists, how it affects your daily life. And I'm going to describe uh, a scenario that uh, was brought about in here in this very community that you're sitting today and how we ultimately began addressing it. But I think it's important for all of you to think what perhaps you should do when you leave this meeting, uh, when you return to your own communities, is to look and see what's happening there, to see perhaps how you might be involved and what changes can be made to alter this really uh, epidemic issue that is uh, quite literally destroying the future of America. So here's, here's some startling numbers. And do you have the lapel thing? No, OK. Um, some startling numbers, but opioid uh, overdose deaths are expected to increase 147%. Now, that doesn't mean much if it's only one, but the numbers we are currently seeing in the last few years have been 62,000 deaths related to opioid use uh, in the U.S. So if you want to start increasing numbers by this magnitude over a very short period of time, uh, this is going to affect uh, you or your family or someone you know very directly, and it probably already has if I were to, to poll this audience, and I've given this talk a number of times, and I'm always startled by the number of uh, people uh, that are affected and admit to the being affected on it. This is my smart, smarter partner, so he, he brought his own. Let's see here. There we go. So what, uh, what is it? What's a team? Well, a team means totally educated about opioids. Yeah, pardon my vernacular there. I changed it a little bit. But that's what I'm asking of people in our health system, to become a team. And it didn't happen overnight, but it did happen because of the crisis that we were facing internally. In 2017, in this county, 955 people uh, experienced opioid overdoses. That's a 103% increase year over year. That's a big number. As I stated, it's going to continue to increase and continue to affect us all. Unfortunately, there's a large uh, majority of these patients uh, are underserved medically. They're either Medicaid, Medicare patients, or totally uninsured, which we uh, see an increasing number again uh, with the cuts in health care. In the last three years in our patient population, we had 865 patients admitted to the Lee Health System with infective endocarditis. Well, I'm a surgeon, a cardiac surgeon. Paul and I deal with this every single day, and it's, it was becoming overwhelming to us. But the variable cost associated with that care is astounding $12 million. Actually, it's $14.8 million and another uh, thing that we provided surgical care over a two-year period for endocarditis, most of which was unreimbursed. And you're asking, well, how can the perfusionists get bigger contracts? How can we make more money or keep the nurses we need? Well, only one way is in your community to figure out how we can reduce this expense to your hospital system. And I guarantee you it is a major expense that's unrecognized uh, or under-evaluated by the administration. So it, it costs you, it costs the community, and it costs everybody uh, around you. So what specifics to us in 19 or excuse me 2016 uh, you can see the discharges the variable costs associated with us but again the grand total uh, for 2019 through February uh, the number of patients already treated in our health system so it's it's not going away we, all we can do is try to blunt the storm and get through this here's Lee Health infective endocarditis by facility and you can see it's a uh, rising number, if we run the line, and I think I've got a slide here next, that pretty shows the progression of the number of increasing consults, increasing patient interactions, and uh, discharges through our health system. So what do we do? Endocarditis, rules of engagement. Well, this is Paul and I, and this is the problem. And it is really difficult to deal with. And we were literally batting our heads against a wall that was not moving. 
much like the sumo wrestler. We couldn't move the needle. We couldn't get the patients the appropriate aftercare. We're surgeons. We do a pretty good job taking care of the uh, problem, and we'll, I'll show you some slides of the problem. But it's afterwards. It, you know, this is it's cutting is one thing, but the cure is something else. And that's where we focused our uh, attention here, and I'll explain that. But here's a number of consults that we were seeing, and it, you can see in August of 16, basically started, uh, find my pointer there, there we go. But again, that straight line is going up to places that are just not tenable. There's four cardiac surgeons in the health system. The number of consults that we were seeing on a regular basis, and month to month, uh, week to week actually, were increasing and overwhelming us as a system. Monthly discharges, substance abuse patients. Now these are not alcohol or tobacco related. This is real substance abuse, and that's, again, a frightening increase. And that's the consequence and a reflection of what's going on across every state in this country. Substance abuse uh, patients, uh, total monthly discharges, you can. It's, it's a rising ship, it's not going anywhere. And the monthly cost, now this is a little bit uh, interesting to figure out, but the average uh, cost uh, was broken down per patient. Now, the vast majority of these patients didn't get uh, full surgical care. They strictly were treated initially medically. Many of them signed out AMA uh, or did not complete their course of antibiotics. If we were to be true to the true management, uh, this is a six to, eight, six to eight week inpatient uh, course of antibiotics because most of these patients can't be trusted with PICC lines or central lines that they can go out and utilize uh, in the habit. So uh, it's, a, it's kind of an abortive number, but it was an attempt to figure out what costs were actually going into it. Nearly 150 babies were born uh, in the last two years uh, with abstinence, uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome, and we have a pretty busy uh, obstetric uh, service uh, here in uh, the health system. Uh, but that number has continued to go up. And it, again, it's a reflection of what's happening around us. 100% increase over two years. Uh, I, I mean, every time you look at a number, it's a re repetitive of what we're seeing. Intravenous drug use reoperation. Now, this is where we were starting to get really frustrated is we had operated on eight, reoperated on eight patients for uh, endocarditis, uh, IV drug use, uh, recent or remote in eight of those patients, less than 30 days from surgery, we had to redo five of them. Now again, this is patient selection because not all of the four of us uh, on any one patient would agree to reoperate on somebody. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty hard rule for us if somebody comes back reinfected in 30 day, within 30 days and we've just done a major operation on them, uh, replaced their valves and they've gone out and relapsed in terms of drug use, uh, it really is an ethical dilemma, okay, so what do we do? And facing that ethical dilemma is what I think prompted us to reevaluate how we are part of a continuum of care and how we can alter this whole uh, scenario. But you can see uh, active currently being treated, six of the patients, uh, antibiotic after less than prophylactic, two, et cetera. Last known status of those eight patients, five actually were alive, and these were just the redo patients. Uh, average months uh, of follow-up was uh, nine. Uh, medication uh, assisted most recent follow-up, only two of them were receiving it for a minimum of one month, maximum of six months. Three expired, uh, one was an in-hospital mortality four days post-procedure, uh, one was of suicide, and we're not sure if that suicide was a drug overdose or uh, some other means, uh, but obviously reflected failure of care at some level, uh, whether it was actually uh, drug abuse or social issues, I'm, I'm not sure. We had one death during readmission, uh, eight months after a second redo, uh, and thus you can see it's a really uh, depressing situation. So here's our average age of endocarditis patients. Uh, male, 55, youngest being 24. Actually, that's not accurate now. We've had uh, a couple 19-year-old uh, who we've had to treat. Female average, 52. So you see it's not just the young people. And we're seeing this more and more. The elderly that have had hip surgery or have had multiple back operations or whatever 
are being exposed to narcotics and unfortunately then becoming addicted. And they find themselves stealing from the medicine cabinet uh, at home and then seeking other alternative sources of drugs. And uh, unfortunately, we are seeing a few and few more patients like this. And I think that that will continue until we really alter uh, the use of narcotics uh, across the country. So aortic disruptions, annular abscesses, uh, you are all been in the operating room when the surgeon's bitching and says, this is the worst thing I've ever seen, and I don't know how I'm going to put this back together again. But this is not an uncommon scenario for aortic valve endocarditis. And again, that's the most common valve of involvement after the tricuspid. Uh, unfortunately, it's the most common valve of involvement that requires surgical intervention. Uh, the tricuspid, more frequently, we can get away with medical therapy. And you can see aortic insufficiency, the disruption of the uh, atrial mitral curtain, uh, and it's, it's a bad problem and one that it just is, uh, uh, can lead to death in the OR uh, or shortly thereafter. Here you see a mitral vegetation. Uh, if I can find it there. Here, uh, it shouldn't be there. It should be nice. Two leaflets that look like this. Uh, when you see this Goomba on there, uh, not a good sign and something has to be done. Again, aortic vegetations here, uh, pretty classic. Uh, mitral vegetations uh, look very similar, just different valves, uh, but both extremely disruptive uh, to function. Again, another uh, example of mitral vegetation, uh, both leaflets and uh, that valve is obviously needs to be out of there. But you see other uh, expressions of endocarditis and septic emboli being one of the most common, particularly those lesions, uh, when you find lesions on the tricuspid valve, this is a frequently concomitant uh, finding, uh, cavitary lesions of septic emboli. Uh, these patients really are sick, uh, frequently end up on a ventilator and getting them off the ventilator is uh, sometimes very difficult. As you can imagine, or as I'm sure you've dealt with uh, in your own uh, practice of perfusion or whatever, that uh, these patients come to the OR frequently cachectic, uh, malnourished, and so they're in no condition to combat uh, these sort of septic events. Uh, unfortunately, when they have left-sided lesions, they can end up in the brain, and we see this that not infrequently. Um, Occasionally, the patients will recover enough that we can then go treat the valvular pathology, but uh, when we see it this way, we have to wait. We have to wait them out to see how they recover and what the neurologic function is like. So here's dermatologic evidence. Now, when I was in med school, there we saw, I saw a couple cases of this, and I've only seen one since I've been in private practice, but it certainly, if I started looking for it more, I'm sure that I would probably see it. And it may go undiagnosed uh, as some other issues, a bug bite here in Florida, of people wearing thongs. Uh, oh, I stubbed my toe or I got a thorn in it or whatever. The reality is the, they've got a septic uh, emboli to their skin and they get necrosis and it doesn't re isn't recognized. So like I said, a chance to cut being a chance to cure doesn't tell the whole story for endocarditis and, and the opioid patients. So uh, we needed to do something different uh, over the last two years, uh, our, recurrent, our readmission rate within 30 days is almost 30 percent. Um, and as you recognize, we get dinged every time somebody comes back to the hospital. But more importantly, and it's an expense, an expense that detracts from the care of other patients and uh, management of the entire community. So I'm not the smartest guy, and Paul will attest to that. Uh, but. You know, pretty soon I recognized that this is not the way to keep doing things. We, we are failing at a miserable uh, rate. So being a surgeon, I'm used to yelling. I yelled very loudly and said, we have to do something different. We have to do something different. And I called everybody uh, to a meeting that I thought might have some input. And that included uh, board members of the hospital, administrators, sheriff's deputies, uh, rehab uh, people, pain management recovery networks that were present in the community that we would never see inside the hospital, uh, communications department, case managers, hospitalists, ER docs. Interestingly, once we got this group together, the, I found this gentleman, Dr. Aaron Wool, 
who is an ER doc, and Aaron uh, had been yelling for a long time about the opioid epidemic here in Lee County. Uh, unfortunately, his voice wasn't as loud as mine, and people generally were not paying attention to him. Uh, fortunately for us as well, however, though, people in Tallahassee and at the federal level were listening to Aaron a little bit, but nobody in the community, and in, in fact, nobody in the hospital system knew how much Aaron knew about this problem. So, uh, if, you know, much to my chagrin, I'm up standing up there yelling at this meeting, and Aaron kind of gets up and uh, starts chiming in, and I turn the floor over to him, and uh, we've had a beautiful partnership since then. Uh, but he is really a smart individual and deserves a large amount of credit for bringing this to the attention uh, of the people who can make a difference. But what happened is, and this, that's an example of failure of communications. We're all living our, work in our little silos. The hospitalists work in their silo. They see the patient. They don't com communicate with anybody else. They want the patient out of the hospital. ER doctors want it out of the ER. They don't want to deal with it. Administrators want to ignore it because it kind of reflects badly on them is that they're giving away all this free care and they don't understand how to deal with it. Uh, communication department didn't know who was talking to who, so they weren't very helpful and they were ignoring the larger uh, uh, headlines that were in the papers all around us that I first opened this talk with. So if you get per too close, your perspective is very limited. You're not gonna see much from there. Unfortunately, if you get too high, you go, don't get the granular detail, but you can see big trends. And that's what, by bringing this group together, we really did uh, vocalize and lay out what are the big trends in our community, and more importantly, how do we carry it down through hospital system, and, how, and then ultimately to patient care, individual patient care. How, does that, how can that be changed and altered so that we don't have a 30% readmission rate, so that we don't have a 100 plus percent increasing rate of endocarditis consults occurring, and so where do we go from there? But uh, building bridges for communication, it can look different, and it is different, and we've created a system that I think uh, uh, is perhaps unique to our status, and when you return to your community, I hope you try to find out what's going on there and become a part of it and, and take some of this that we've learned. But from the beginning, and this is, again, I had to re-educate myself, not re-educate, educate actually, uh, to the entire spectrum of opioid and addictive behavior. Uh, these, this is an illness, this isn't a social stigma that is frequently attached to drug use. Uh, it is a true illness. These people have an altered brain chemistry that two doses of a narcotic in some of these patients will turn on that neuroreceptor that then makes them crave the drug. Now, they may not be addicts after two doses, but they certainly will be craving the drug. And after up to four doses, true addiction can occur. Now, that's not common, but it, it has been proven and shown that as many as as few as four doses of a narcotic can turn that receptor into something that overtakes the patient and overtakes their life. So recognizing that, uh, you have to go back and say, well, what's unique about these people? Well, there's frequently they have social issues that have allowed this neuro uh, receptor to be unmasked. They have physical conditions, whether, as I stated, they may have undergone a number of surgeries and unfortunately been exposed to narcotics uh, rather willy-nilly. We'll talk about the, the social implications of the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma if we want. Um, and then, obviously, medical conditions as well. But we wanted to create a team, the start, if you will, that stops uh, addiction, uh, excuse me, stop addiction response team. As soon as these people hit the ER, we now have a whole team. We have a, an addiction specialist that's been hired since July when we started this project, uh, when we came together, actually didn't start the project. Uh, we have social services. We have full communication and interaction with outpatient uh, ongoing resources that provide MAT, which is medically assisted therapy to these patients. So you've heard of methadone, obviously. Buprenorphine is in Suboxone uh, are now becoming equal or more utilized than methadone. They're a little easier to use. Uh, there's less incidence of abuse, particularly with Suboxone because it has Narcan in it, so they can't grind it up and shoot it. Uh, doesn't work for them, so they won't abuse it. Um, so there's very little resale of Suboxone. There's no retail market for that. 
Um, and so it really is kind of the ideal drug. Now when Suboxone first uh, came out, um, it, the uh, thinking was going to be that we would put the patients on Suboxone for a period of say six months or so, then they would get them off, they would be fine, da 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 da. Well, what we've found is that the patients, uh, with methadone as well, but particularly with Suboxone, live a very normal functional life. They go to work, they raise their family, uh, they get on about their daily business. If they've been on it for a while, they can have home prescriptions for Suboxone. They don't have to show up at a clinic every single day. Uh, and they can do it weekly or twice or two weeks at a time and then check in with the doctor. Um, so it's been a really, really good drug. And the other thing about Suboxone, it's safe in pregnancy. So that's also critical to this uh, uh, population. But anyway, so now we've got all this. We've got medically assisted therapy available. Uh, in Florida, as across the country, you have to have an X waiver, which just is a change in the DEA designation for, your, for the drug uh, prescriber. I got an X waiver. I think I might be the only heart surgeon in the country that has an X waiver. Um, but it's not hard to get. You go online and, and do, it's like an eight hour course or whatever. Um, and it's actually very informative. But I got the X waiver. Uh, one of our PAs who was instrumental in, in starting this program with us got an X waiver. Now virtually all the hospitalists have X waiver, gotten X waivered and many of the ER doctors. They'll start, now in our ER, they'll start patients on uh, medically assisted therapy, uh, virtually all of it Suboxone. So it has changed the way the patients are presenting to us. We're, we're treating them and getting them before they've infected themselves with endocarditis. And the hope being we're reducing admissions and um, we're reducing uh, readmissions and surgical interactions with these patients. But we've, uh, I just kind of went over all this, but we have long-term uh, hospital, or uh, out-of-hospital uh, facilities now that are interested in helping us with this. They recognize the community need and have, have really stepped up in a big way. Uh, this does not exclude the traditional 12-step program. Uh, this should be used in part with it, but the reality is if somebody tries to get off of opioids uh, as an abstinence-only approach, the relapse rate is much higher and the mortality is much higher because the trouble is they lose their tolerance. They're, they stay off of it for a couple months, uh, then they want to relapse, they buy the drug, they buy the normal dose that they had taken prior to becoming abstinent, they shoot it, and they die. Uh, they are overdose, uh, and so again, it's because of loss of tolerance. So abstinence alone uh, does not work uh, nearly as well, and there's a lot of scientific papers that are now uh, very strongly endorsing medically assisted therapy for these patients, and it should be the, the cornerstone of treatment. But again, not limiting 12-step. There's a lot of, lot of social and, and beneficial introspective things that these people should be doing. For us, uh, MAT also means other things. I mean, managing post-op pain can be a challenge. If a patient comes in and they're an IV drug abuser, well, what do you use? You start them back on oxys or you give them morphine? Um, interestingly, uh, Suboxone has been, uh, has been around a long time. None of us knew about it. But it is available for a pain medication. So we can use that for pain management in these patients. And if they come in on Suboxone, uh, obviously we keep them on the Suboxone and do it. Methadone's a little bit more difficult, uh, particularly in the hospital setting. Um, but the, the thing is to be aware and to not neglect their treatment. Now, some of these patients, if, the, if you don't have Suboxone available to them, uh, will use narcotics. They may need require, they may require more uh, dosing than you uh, normally use. But the, you have to recognize that that's where they're brain is adjusted to, deal with it, and then start again therapy after you get through the initial event. Um, so I just addressed that. The other things that we're looking at is what else is available out there besides narcotics? Well, a couple of our young nurses, uh, Emily and Edwin, uh, came to me one day and said, have you ever done virtual reality? And I'm an old guy. No, I haven't. I live in virtual reality. Uh, but uh, they, they brought the... Uh, the uh, Google glasses to me and so I put them on and I did a, uh, a virtual uh, trip uh, through Venice and I've been to Venice a couple times so it was like being there again and then I did a uh, coral dive uh, with the fish it was fascinating and with those on you actually forget where you are you forget what you're doing so we have launched a, uh, a prospective uh, randomized trial we're going to use it in uh, our abuse patients 
and see what the uh, pain medication requirements are with those receiving or getting virtual reality therapy uh, versus those that don't get it. And I, I frankly am anticipating uh, that, that perhaps that's going to show a decline use in narcotics and pain medicines overall. But again, meditation, group therapy, these are all things that need to be thought about, that can be looked at, and may be very helpful in managing these patients. So ultimately, what is a team? Well, it's, it's people that are tolerant, they're empathetic, they're adaptable, and they're motivated. And I, I, one thing I really want to emphasize is removing that stigma of drug use. Um, and I had it, uh, virtually the, all the people of my age have it to some extent. They don't understand the psychology, they don't understand the medical changes, the biochemistry, the neurochemistry that goes into addiction. And it was also kind of alarming to me the same stigma held for the younger people, the nurses on our floor, uh, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, whatever. But once they became engaged in this process and became educated themselves, it really was like opening the door and the sunlight came in and it's really changed the way that they approach the patients. And I think for a better, maybe this will be an example of the way we should deal with other issues as they come to us, uh, be much more open. So we're caring people and we're treating an illness. We want to remember that. So I thank you. Uh, one other plug, well, it doesn't show up, but uh, Paul and I represent 50% of uh, a team, a cardiac surgical team that was named top 50 uh, in the US by IBM Watson. So we're proud of that. So. Again, thank you. Any questions?